Good evening again, and welcome, welcome, welcome to our Wednesday night dinner. Hope you have come hungry tonight as we feast on the Word of God. God is good, and we want to continue to study uh, from the Word tonight. We are going to look at the Minor Prophets, uh, but before we do, I want to open up with a word of prayer. Father, we ask you to be with us tonight. Father, we pray that uh, I would be removed out of the way and you would use me as a mighty vessel. Father, we pray for all the ones that are on conference call and on Facebook Live. We just pray, Father, that all of our hearts would be receptive uh, to your word on tonight. Thank you for your blessing, just for the blessing of being able to study your word. Thank you again. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen, everyone. And again, welcome uh, to our class uh, on tonight. Uh, you remember, we finished up the book of Hosea. And someone had uh, sent in a request uh, that we would study from the book of Joel. And others may want, was interested in a New Testament uh, book. So what I decided to do on tonight is I'm going to do and uh, look at the Minor Prophets, but I really want to do an overview of the Minor Prophets. Now I want to start with Hosea and go all the way through Malachi. Now just This is just an overview because what you're going to find out as you read and study the Minor Prophets, that there is a major theme that runs throughout all 12 of them. And that major theme is that God is going to bring judgment upon the northern tribe and the southern tribe, Judah and Israel. And that's what each one of these prophets are prophesying about, how God is going to bring judgment. So we did an in-depth study on the book of Hosea, and that really opened our eyes up to what God is really doing and what he's going to do uh, to uh, the northern tribe of Israel. So when we go through the rest of the Minor Prophets, you want to find out that God is basically saying the same thing through every one of these prophets. Some of them prophesied to the northern tribe, like Hosea. Some of them prophesied to the southern tribe of Judah. And then you're going to have some of the prophets that's going to prophesy to both northern and southern, Israel and Judah. So what I want to do, since we already have an in-depth look at the prophecy, that God had prophesied through Hosea, I just want to look at each one of these prophets and give you an overview. So if you have your Bibles and you want to turn back to the book of Hosea and just flip over to each one of these prophets as I give you the overview. Now let's kind of go back and look at Hosea uh, again. The book of Hosea. Now, Hosea's name means salvation. In his book, it was written primarily to the northern kingdom, as his name suggests. He seeks Israel's salvation by repentance. Otherwise, they face destruction and captivity which eventually happened uh, when the Assyrians invade and take the northern uh, kingdom uh, as slaves. So we leave the book of Hosea, and we come to the book of Joel. And if you turn over to the book of Joel, let me just kind of give you a brief history and outline of the book of Joel. Now, Joel's name means Jehovah, or Yahweh, is God or Lord. The main focus of the book of Joel 
is the coming day of the Lord. He writes about the coming judgment or the destruction of the land visitation by locusts. Now, whether or not these were real locusts as they devoured the crops in a time of drought, or they were implements of war, it's kind of hard to tell the difference and to be for certain. But Joel speaks of a day of darkness. He speaks of a day of gloom. He talks about the darkness and the clouds and the thick darkness in Joel chapter 2 and verse number 2. But he also describes a judgment of the nation uh, of the crimes against God's people. And you read that in chapter 3, verses 2 through verse 19. Although there appears to be a partial or a parallel between uh, Israel being attacked and Christians being persecuted, the message seems to be specifically sent to a unrepentant uh, nation of Israel. Now, although there are many principles and they can have application to those outside uh, of the stock as Israel uh, as well, but in the book of Joel, God seeks to have his people to return. He seeks to have them to repent and come back to him through fasting and prayer Amen. and weeping, Amen. humbling themselves before God. And you read that in Joel chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, and also chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. So Joel is a very interesting uh, book. But then you come to the prophet Amos. Amos, the very name Amos means to carry or to be born or carried by God. He primarily prophesied to the northern kingdom who had become comfortably wealthy and begin to have a false sense of uh, security. When we look at the book of Amos, Amos focused on two areas of sin, both in the southern kingdom of Judah, and he also speaks to the northern kingdom, uh, which is Israel. Now, two of the greatest sins that were occurring and the northern kingdom are also prevalent to us today. One of them was social injustice, and the other one was idolatry. Now, there is so much corruption in governments of the world, and this corruption leads to the very smallest town in the rural areas of our country. The idolatry a pleasure and prosperity takes the place of God. And because they trusted in their prosperity, they trusted in their riches and their wealth, it actually provided for them, they thought, their food, and they thought it provided security Amen. and pleasure. Amen. But it was a false sense of security. And that is what Amos tries to warn uh, the nation uh, of Israel and the nation of Judah all about. So Amos carries with him the burden of God's people because they had begun to believe and they had begun to trust yes, sir. in a false security. Yes, sir. But then we come to the book of Obadiah. Now, Obadiah is a very interesting book. Matter of fact, Obadiah means 
servant yes. of God. Yes, sir. Or he means servant of the Lord. Yes, sir. What Obadiah does in his book, he tries to reassure Judah that Ephraim, victorious and deadly attacks against them, will be avenged by God himself. Obadiah, he writes, and this was written to Judah's faith, because their faith was very weak. And God wanted to assure the nation that he will care for his people. And that he'll always work for them. Even during uh, this evil time, such as the time that Obadiah is writing to, God wants to assure them that he would take care of them. Even today, the church faces such persecution and believers need to turn to the book of Obadiah for reassurance that God will never leave us, yeah. nor will he forsake us. Yes. God, he will judge believers persecutors in due time. Yes. So whenever you feel like, even today as Christians, that God may have left you in the midst of your persecution or in the midst of your trial, let me encourage you, go back and read the book of Obadiah. Now I know that's one of those books that we don't spend a lot of time in. But it's such an interesting book because God will reassure you that he will not leave you in the midst of your suffering. He will not leave you in the midst of your persecution. He will stay right there with you, right in the midst of your situation. And we can learn that from uh, the book of Obadiah. But then we come to the book of Jonah. Now, I don't need to say a lot about Jonah because most of us and most of the people that is listening to me tonight are mostly individuals that have any knowledge of the minor prophets have a pretty good idea about Jonah. Now, we may not know about Joel or Obadiah, but we know about Jonah. And we find out that in the book of Jonah, Jonah's name really means peace hmm. or dove, of which a dove is symbolic of. Jonah shows us that you cannot run and you cannot hide from God or his express divine will. There is no place to hide. There is nowhere to run that God is not already there. Amen. Jonah resisted until he was trapped in the belly of a great fish. And even then, he resisted wanting to save Nineveh because Nineveh was one of Israel's worst enemies and bitter rivals. And Jonah did not want them uh, to be saved. But what is the lesson for you and I? What can we learn from the book of Jonah? The lesson here for Christian may be that God desires all to be saved. Yes. Even those that may be our enemies, God seeks for them to be saved. Yes. And since God has compassion for them, so should you and I have compassion yes, for sir. even our worst enemy. Yes. So what do we gain from the book of Jonah? Yes, sir. A couple of things let me leave with you. Number one, you can't hide from God. You can't run far enough that you'll be out of the very presence of God. And then we learn that God loves 
everyone. Yes. And God wants everyone uh, to be saved. Even Peter talks about that in his writing. That God don't want no one to perish. But he wants everyone all to come to repentance. He wants everyone to be saved. God has such a compassionate heart for the laws. And if God has a compassionate heart for the lost, you and I should have that same kind of compassionate hearts for those that are lost. So we leave the book of Jonah, the minor prophet Jonah, and we come up next to Micah. Now, Micah, again, is a very interesting uh, book. Matter of fact, Micah's name means who is like God. Come on. Now, to answer that question, you know, of course, is no one is like God. God alone is transcendent. Yeah. But Micah's message was that the great disparity between the rich and the very poor was a judgment against them. We read, he talks about the greedy landlords in chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. He talks about the political corruption that had caused the entire nation yeah. to become morally yeah. bankrupt. Yes, sir. We find that out in chapter 6, verses 9 through 16. And also chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. So God rose up a great nation. And that was the nation of Assyria. To be the rod of correction. Yeah. To bring his nation under his righteous judgment. There are great similarities Amen. between ancient Israel and Judah and the nation uh, today. Yes, sir. So Micah, again, is a very interesting book. Let me encourage you to go back and read the book of Micah. But we leave the book of Micah and next we come to Nahum. Now, again, that is one of those books that not too many of us are familiar with. But it is a very interesting uh, book. Matter of fact, Nahum's name means comfort. Yes, sir. Or comfort. comforter. Nahum's message was designed to bring a voice of relief, a comfort, a joy for those who have been suffering under the hands of the oppressive nation. These merciless nations will not go unpunished. And the book is intended to comfort God's people with the fact that no crime against them will escape his sight. Amen. Most assuredly, God will avenge his people and he will uh, re-avenge the believers today for those who despitefully yes. use us, ah. those who unfairly yeah. accuse us, and those who shamefully abuse us will be dealt with by God. So we must leave vengeance to God, it is up to him to pay back. And you remember Paul says in Romans 12 and verse number 19, Vengeance is mine, saith the, the Lord. Lord. Also Deuteronomy 32 and verse 35 says, Vengeance is mine, the Lord will repay. So what do we get from the minor prophet Nahum? We get from this small book that God will take vengeance upon them who misuse his people. Yes. And Nahum is bringing a voice of joy, a voice of relief to God's people. So the next time you feel like taking vengeance out on someone 
the next time you feel like getting even with someone because of something they may have done or said to you, let me encourage you. Go back and read this book of Nahum. You will find out that God will take care of your oppressors. He'll take care of your avengers. God will be the one. It's not left up to you and I. So we need to turn it over to God. Remember, nothing is out of the sight of God. Whatever people are doing to you, whatever they are saying to you, that is in the very sight of God. God sees it all. Just turn it over to him. Amen. And that's what Nahum was bringing to the table. Yeah. That's what he was sharing with God's people. Amen. His very name means, let me comfort you. Yeah. And letting you know yeah. that God will take care of those that abuse you. Yes, he will. So then we come to the next man of prophet. And that is Habakkuk. Now most of us have heard sermons yes. from the book of Habakkuk. But we really may not know what this prophet is really all about. Matter of fact, Habakkuk's name means embrace. Amen. That's what his name means. It means embrace. Now, that is a comforting thought that God wants to embrace us during our trials. And we should embrace his word, Habakkuk, is consumed with a burning desire to proclaim the glory of the Lord. Habakkuk reminds me a lot of the book of Jeremiah because of his deep concern yes. for the wayward people yes. of Israel, which had turned their back on God and his covenant. Yes. Habakkuk gives hope because of the certainty of God's coming. And we read that in Habakkuk 3, verses 3 through 7. And the assurance that he will judge the nations that are opposed to his purpose. Chapter 3, verses 8. Through 15. So Habakkuk lets us know that God will embrace us. God wants us to embrace Him. Yes. So the next time you feel a little down and out, and you feel like you are an outcast, you feel like a throwaway, go back and read the book of Habakkuk. Trust Him. Because Habakkuk lets us know that even in the midst, God have embraced us. He, he holds us, even in our suffering, even in our trial. Can't we see the similarities of all of these prophets? Every one of these minor prophets are prophesied to Israel and to Judah the very same thing. And oftentimes I wonder, why did they have to keep saying the same thing yes. over and over yes. and over? Because see, God wanted them to get the message. Yes. And when one prophet may have died out, another one had to come and prophesy the same thing. But it's interesting to note that several of these prophets prophesied right along beside each other. Yes. So they wanted God's people to know Come on. that judgment is coming. Yes. But they don't have to be judged. They do not. If they just understand that God has compassion and God loves them and God will embrace them. Well, we leave the book of Habakkuk. We come to the next book. And that's the book of Zephaniah. Yes, sir. Now, again, that is a book in your Bible. Good book. Yes, just flip over from Habakkuk, and you'll come to this, this prophet, Zephaniah. Now, what is this book all about? It's really 
pray about it, we can understand his name. Because Zephaniah's name means hidden by God. Teach us now. The book of Zephaniah begins with a universal declaration that judgment is swiftly coming. Come on. And that the remnant of Israel and other nations will be saved when he returns. Remnant. In chapter 3, verses 9 through 13. We also talks about this and like it because we oftentimes quote Romans 8 and verse number 28. That even the evil things that occur can be accomplished with God's will. Even through Zephaniah. Speaks about the day of gloom. He speaks about the day of doom. That God will save all who call out to his name. And a remnant yes. will be saved yes. according to chapter 3 and verse number 11. Yes. So when you read the book of Zephaniah, you, you really come to find out that that God is not going to destroy them all. No, all of them will not be lost. Amen. There will be a remnant Come on, Lord. that will be saved. And you will find that so interesting when you read the book of Romans in the New Testament. Yes. And you will find the exact same thing that this man of prophet, yes. Zephaniah, prophesied thousands of years earlier. I like this book. And even though you read the book and you may not understand some of the language, but the main thrust of the book of Zephaniah is, is that there will be a remnant saved. Amen. Same thing is true for us, even on this day. Well, let's leave the book of Zephaniah. Let's come to the next book. That is the book of Haggai. Yes. Now, Haggai's name has a much different name than most of the prophets. Now, his name means festive. Now, what I mean by festive? What, what do we mean when we talk about his name means festive? Well, why is it festive? God does not name his people, nor do he name his prophets without a purpose. Amen. Now, Haggai optimistically calls on God's people to repent and to rebuild the holy temple. Because the sovereign God desires to be worshipped. And he is most worthy to be worshipped. According to chapter 1 and verse number 8. See, God is concerned that his people have lost their desire for God's presence. Haggai writes in hope. That God's people will repent and rebuild the temple. And only then will God's presence return to them. Hagar wants to remind God's people that he desires to have a relationship with him. According to chapter 2 and verses 4 through 5. So why is his name Festa? It means festival. It means celebration. Yes. It means coming together and having a, my, a good time in the Lord. But God's people had turned and they got to the point that why they did not desire the very presence of God. So what Haggai does he writes to God's people and encourages them to rebuild the temple so the very presence of God will return so that they then can worship him and celebrate 
having all of these festivals that they can enjoy and worship and have God in their presence. So this book of Hagar is really about the return in the of the presence of God. And he tried to get God's people that had a desire for God's love, but they had lost it. They had lost the very desire to be in the presence of God. Mercy. Now that could fit in the case mm. of some people today. Woo. And if you fall into that category of where you are at the point in your life mm -hmm. where you have lost your desire for the presence of mm -hmm. God, you may need to go back and read the book of Hagar because it will encourage you because God wants to be in your presence. Yes. He wants to be in my presence. But I found out he will not force himself upon us. We must have a desire for his presence. And I pray tonight that you haven't lost your desire for the presence of God like Israel had lost their desire for the presence, presence. of God. Come on back. Well, mm. we talked about Hagar. Mm. Let's come to Zechariah. Zechariah. Zechariah, again, is one of the books in the Old Testament. He's a minor prophet. But what is it that Zechariah have to share with God's people? See, the name of this prophet is a reminder to God's people that he will not Forget his own. As Zechariah's name means, remembered by God. Come on. That's what his name Come really means. Come on. Zechariah is one of the prophets whose book mentions language that suggests the coming of the Messiah. Yes. When you read chapter 2, verses 5 and verse number 10, even this book mentioned the coming of Christ into the city riding on a donkey. Yes. And you remember it's fulfilled in the book of Matthew in the New Testament. But Zechariah prophesied about the Messiah coming yes. into the city riding on a donkey. Zechariah's language is that that is interwoven with nature mm. of the present and uh, of the past. And sometimes we cannot separate Come it on. for the reason because it's so difficult to determine the portion in the book of Zechariah because it's hard when you read it to really understand whether or not Zechariah is talking about things that are present or whether or not he's talking about things uh, to come. Yes. This book is full of prophecy that have been fulfilled, but it's so full of prophecy that has not been uh, fulfilled. Uh, uh, so when you read the book of Zechariah, just, just remember his name. His name means remembered by God. In other words, the book of Zechariah helps all of us, especially Israel and Judah, to remember that God remembers you. God has not forgotten you. God has not thrown you away. He remembers what you're going through. He remembers what you have been through. And God remembers us. And I know sometimes you may feel like God has forgotten all about you. And we'll say, God, where are you? God, do you see me? God, do you remember where I am? God, do you remember my name? Do you remember my situation? 
God, have you forgotten all about me? Whenever you get to that point, go back and read the book of Zechariah. Because what you're going to find out is that God remembers you. Even though sometimes we may forget him, he never forgets us. He will always remember us. Even when we are in our toughest situation, in the midst of our suffering, he remembers. Yes. And he will embrace us. Yes. He will have compassion on us. And he will be in the presence Amen. if we love it. All of these books seem to be interwoven uh, together. But then we come uh, to the last book. That is the book of Malachi. Now, Malachi, the last man of prophet, what this book is really all about. See, the name Malachi means my messenger. That's what his name means. And when he used the word my, he means that he is God's messenger. So when you read the book of Malachi, this last book in the Old Testament is like a final warning or parting shot to Israel that the great and terrible day of the Lord is coming. And he records that in chapters 4, verses 1 and verse 2. God is angry with the fact that his people are robbing him in tithes and offering. And also, he's angry because there are those masters and late laborers who are not being paid their fair wages. You read that in chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Malachi gives the prophecy that Elijah will come before the day of the Lord ah. in chapter 4 and verses 5 and 6. And now this was fulfilled in the coming of John the Baptist, who came in the spirit of Elijah, preaching the repentance. And you find that out in Mark chapter 1 and verse number 4, and in Matthew chapter 3 and verse number 1. Amen. So we see then, as we look back over all of these Mount of Prophets. Mm. We see that there is a, a theme that goes through every one of them. And it's basically the same thing. So that's just an overview mm, of teacher. all of the prophets. So in my conclusion, one thing is certain. Yeah. And that is the fact yes, sir. that all of these prophets yes, sir. testified yes, that sir. the Lord is coming again. Yes. But this time, it will be to judge yes. all those who refuse yes, to repent yes. and trust yes. in Christ. So when we look then at this particular part, for all the unrepentant, it will be swift and a sudden judgment. There will be no second chance and the time may be short. If Christ returns yes. at this moment yes. or the next, the person that have not trusted in Christ after repentance, this doom would be too terrible to even describe with words. Just read Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. Yes. Now, I am certainly no prophet. But I can assure you that all of those who refuse to bend the knee today will bend it yes, sir. someday. Uh, we will all stand before the Lord to give an account for our lives. Jesus Christ is coming again. And 
He will either be your savior. Oh. Or he will be. Your judge. Your judge. Come on. So the question tonight is this. When he returns, will he be your savior? Or will he be your judge? Amen. You have an opportunity. Amen. Right now to render obedience unto the Lord. Yes. Come to him tonight. Yes. Tomorrow may be too late. Too late. Today you hear his voice. Harden not. He says, harden not your heart. If you need to render obedience to the gospel, just let us know. Or let someone know that you want to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ by repenting of your sins, confessing him, and being buried with him in baptism, putting him on, being clothed with him. If you need to just confess and return back to the Lord, let me encourage you to do that. Remember every one of these prophets prophesied the return of the Lord and repentance was needful for Israel and Judah. Repentance is needful for us today. Yes. So let me encourage you to do that. Thank you for joining with us tonight. I hope that that kind of gave you an overview of the minor yes. prophets. But you go back and read them. Interesting read in these prophets. Now remember this. Some of the things you read in these minor prophets are unfulfilled. And some of the prophets, prophecies has been fulfilled. Yes. But you read them and, you go to, and that's going to come in very handy. When we read the New Testament. So Lord's willing. As someone says. And the creek don't rise. We want to start. With a New Testament book. Let's look at the book of Romans. Yes. I think we're going to spend a little time. In the book of Romans. Now when we go through the book of Romans. You'll find out that a lot of things. Paul makes mention yes, of. In the book of Romans. Yes, come sir. right out. Of these prophets yes, that we have just talked about. So if you want to jump ahead of me, go ahead, start reading. Lord's willing, next week I will just do an introduction to the book of Romans before we start dive deep into that book. May God bless you. May God bless you well on tonight. Let us end with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for these minor prophets. Father, we thank you for what they taught us. Not only taught Israel and Judah, but what they taught us. And Father, help us to learn the lesson yes. that, that Judah had to learn and Israel had to learn. Father, help us not to go down the road yes. that they went down. But Father, help us to be all that you want us to be. Thank you for the time that we have spent in these books. And we thank you because you are a mighty God, a God who loves us, a God who has compassion on us, a God who embraces us, yes. a God who will never leave us, yes. a God who remembers, remembers us, remembers. and a God who will save us. Yes. And we thank you, for we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone.